Good afternoon. So it's a pleasure to have again a new talk in this series of IEEE Sequence System Society uh, talks together with um, um, graduate program of microelectronics of the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul and the uh, Institute of Informatics and also Engineering School. So um, this is becoming, since uh, several weeks, a traditional meeting point each week. So each week with uh, always some uh, very nice talks as you are going to have today. So um, uh, uh, Leandro uh, has done his undergrad in the city of Uruguayana. No? Then he has done in Santa Maria. And then, uh, no, no, I'm doing a mistake, no? <laughs> so Leandro has done in Santa Maria. Santa Maria. The, the undergrad, then he has done uh, the master here in Porto Alegre. PhD was a double diploma from UFRGS uh, in Porto Alegre with uh, Darmstadt University in uh, Germany. So in the lab uh, uh, of uh, Manfred Glesner. Uh, and then after that, uh, Leandro was a research at the lab in Darmstadt, and finally he moved to the uh, University of York. So this is a very brief... Uh, so if you want to see all the accomplishments of uh, Leandro and all the interest paper he has published, also with some uh, awards, like in date, for uh, his work, you can address his... Uh, website and his uh, CV and because uh, now I think it's time to give the floor to Leandro to start his presentation. So he's going to use now his screen sharing. So thank you very much for everybody for attending. And then Leandro, the floor is with you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Ricardo, for, for the invitation. First of all, this is such a nice series with lots of well-known researchers and educators and academics and now industrialists uh, in the area of electronic systems, uh, electronic circuits and systems. And I'm glad to, to be here giving a talk on evolutionary optimization of cyber physical systems, which is uh, perhaps a big umbrella topic for the latest research I've done uh, since uh, I moved to York effectively. So I've been in New York since um 2008 uh as part of the real-time systems group in the department of computer science so uh the outline of my, my talk will uh address three different levels of optimization that we have addressed within the area of cyber physical systems at optimization at the computational level at the communication level and also at the physical process level and we are going to explain how we use cloud infrastructure to uh, get this optimization to happen, even in the case of fairly sophisticated problems. And then I'll close the talk with uh, some future research, at least some hints, and then I'll, I'll welcome questions on those future research topics as well. Some of them we have already started. Let's uh, first have uh, a common understanding of what the cyber physical system is. Uh, cyber physical systems are interconnected systems. So computers, computing infrastructure, computers and networks will interact with physical processes, will sense from those physical processes, will act upon those physical processes using computer technology, network technology. And because of the dynamic nature of those systems, they interact with the environment at all times. The computation and the communication uh, activities have hard or real soft constraints. And also the application-driven processes will also have their timing constraints. You need things to happen within time bounds once the user interacts with the system or once the environment of the system changes. Some events will drive some computation that needs to process a reaction that must be applied on time. And those timing constraints will have an impact on the usability, but also the safety and security requirements of those systems. And here in the figures, I have a few examples of 
cyber physical systems in the health, in the chemical process, in aerospace domain, but they're mostly uh, illustrative examples. What we usually have is a number of sensors, a number of actuators, a number of processing units that are distributed and interconnected and have to understand the environment, calculate reactions to changes in the environment and act upon that environment. That's why the cyber physical system is the interaction between the computational side and the physical process. Our research tries to optimize cyber physical systems so that they can meet those timing constraints. And we do that, as I've mentioned, at the computation level, communication level, and the physical process level. At the computation level, we want to make sure that all those computational tasks that try to calculate reactions to changes in the environment, calculate reactions to keep the system operating as desired, those tasks, usually software tasks that will run on top of multiprocessor multi -processor systems, uh, high performance computing systems, even cloud computing, all those tasks need to be executed within time bound. So we need to manage, we need to optimize the way these tasks are executing and uh, reading and writing from different interfaces such as sensors, actuators, so that those computation tasks happen within uh, the real time constraint. Likewise, uh, in a cyber physical system, as I've mentioned, all this computation and the sensors and actuators are distributed and connected over networks. So at the communication level, we want these messages that receive data Sorry, there was a problem with the connection with uh, Leandro. So just waiting a little bit for he reconnect again. Uh, I think the internet connection is not ideal. I hope okay. you can hear me now. We are listening to you now again. All right. Uh, now I give you... to you the the rights to to okay. read on. Okay. Let me share my slides again. Okay. Great. All right. So uh, I've mentioned that we try to optimize cyber physical systems to meet constraints at computational level. I've mentioned also that the communication level messages should be delivered from sensors to computation units, from computational units to actuators uh, within uh, time bounds, but also the physical processes, movement of data, movement of goods. So opening a particular uh, barrier, in a parking system, or moving a particular machine, or processing a particular part within a machine, all those activities have timing constraints. So some of the optimization has to be done to make sure that the process uh, deadlines are also met. And these are the three areas that I hope I can give some examples during this talk. So let's move on. Optimization in general is something that takes into account a particular system, takes into account a configuration of a system and tries to make that configuration better in some regard. So, uh, there are many different ways to do optimizations and people that have seen previous talks in this series, you have already seen some uh, examples of optimization. I remember one of the interesting talks that I've seen, uh, people try to optimize the communication within a particular layout cell for, for uh, standard cell libraries. That's one way to optimize a system to try to minimize the number of uh, metal layers that you need to connect the inputs and the outputs of a cell. Uh, in our case here, we are dealing with many different kinds of systems, but the idea of optimizing configurations is actually the same. 
there are many ways to do optimization. And in our case, we will always uh, use one specific kind of algorithm, which are evolutionary algorithms to help us with the optimization. And the, the fitness function for this optimization, the way that the optimization checks how good the new configurations are, in our case here, are always based on real-time analytical models. I'm going to give you some hints about those two parts of our optimization engines. And I'll start with evolutionary algorithms, and we apply this to all classes of optimization. I've mentioned computation level, communication level, process level. We use evolutionary algorithms for all of them. And then for each kind of system, we need to derive different uh, real-time analytical models that are specific for the system. So let's start first understanding the evolutionary algorithms. People from computer science have already some background, so maybe I'll repeat things that you already know. So I'll go very fast. Uh, in an evolutionary algorithm, the evolutionary optimization will have a population of possible configurations for my system, and it will try to improve this population of configurations by evaluating the fitness of each one of them. So each configuration needs to be evaluated somehow, and those are the fitness functions that I'll discuss later. Once we know the fitness of each one of the different elements in this population of configurations, we take the best ones and then we mix them up, we breed them, we use crossover operators to get new individuals which are based out of mixtures of uh, the best individuals that we have in the population. And then we create some additional mutations so that we replace the old population with, just, with this new population that includes the best and some crossovers and mutations of the best. And we keep rotating over that series of activities until some termination condition will be true. Either we rotated, we did so many generations, every time we go around this algorithm, we call that this is a generation, and a termination condition could be a fixed number of generations. But I can also have uh, other termination conditions, such as I found an indiv individual with a fitness of 13, 14, or I have paid so much for the computers running this evolutionary optimization, I think I have to be satisfied with the, the fitness that I found. So there are many ways to stop the process, but the idea is that the process will keep evolving configurations so that we will have at the end a system configuration which is better than the ones that I had at the beginning. Which are the ones that I had at the beginning? Maybe the current configuration of the system, the one that I'm trying to improve, or maybe just some random configurations. If I have no idea where to start, I can even start with just some random configurations. And then as I evolve those configurations, better and better configurations will start, start to appear. These configurations, in the case of an evolutionary algorithm, they are modeled as a chromosome. So let's take a look how a potential chromosome could look like. Uh, in this case, the chromosome is representing one kind of configuration that we use a lot in cyber physical systems, which is allocation of tasks to processing elements. This could be software tasks over a particular CPU, or, or this could be a, a metal cutting task over a machine, or this could be a packet over a network link. So this kind of allocation of resources is commonly used in cyber physical systems, and we uh, model them as a chromosome like that. We have one gene of that chromosome for each task, and then the content of that gene tells where that particular task will be allocated. In this case, we have tasks one, two, three, all the way to task n, and then we see there the index of the processing element that will, allo will have that task allocated to it. And I can create random configurations, so I can have hundreds of different chromosomes like that randomly created. I can easily uh, have crossover so that I have the first half of one chromosome and the second half of another chromosome to produce a new configuration, to produce a new allocation of tasks that has tasks one to n over two from the parent, one of the parents, and from n over two to n from the other parent. Or I can have mutations that will randomly change the content of some chromosomes. So you can see, in this particular example, all the steps that we have seen before, that I can have a random population at the start, I can then get the best configurations 
uh, mix them, mutate them, and keep evolving towards uh, uh, an, an optimized solution. So uh, the fitness function is the one that puts pressure on this evolution to keep the best chromosomes in the evolved population. And this, as I've mentioned, the fitness function will always be different depending on the kind of problem that we're trying to optimize. So let's go back to my big picture and let's look one at a time those three levels that I've mentioned before, computation, communication, and process. We start with computation. And for computation level optimization, what we try to do, it's exactly this sort of example that I've just mentioned. I have a number of software tasks that will have to be allocated to some sort of many core multiprocessor platform. And the configurations that I want to optimize can be the task, the core allocation, the clock frequency of those cores, the priorities of those tasks. There are many different configurations that we might want to optimize. And that's something that we have uh, looked into in three different projects funded by the UK Research Council, EPSRC, projects Low Power NOC and MCC, and also the EU funded Dream Cloud project has also some work in this area. Let's take a look at uh, a specific example, which is the optimization of a cyber physical system controller based on a network on chip multiprocessor. In such a controller, I have a number of tasks that are processing data coming from sensors that are producing data that will have to be sent to actuators. And these tasks have to be allocated to some of the processing elements of the CPU of this multiprocessor. And these tasks, they, because this is running in a large system, we cannot really have a shared memory for all of them to communicate. So the communication happens uh, as point-to-point -point communications within a network on chip. So tasks running one processor element have to send data to tasks running a different processor element so that this data can be read by the destination task. And this transfer happens over uh, a network on chip. We have a few papers in this area if you want to learn uh, more details about networks on chip. And what we want in the evolutionary process here is if I have a chromosome or a population of chromosomes with random allocations for tasks T1, T2, T3, all the way to Tn, I want over the generations, I want all those, all those tasks and the network packets that they generate to communicate with each other. I want all of that to meet the timing constraints so that all of them become schedulable, meaning they will have, they will meet their hard real time constraints, all of them. And in this plot that I show on the right-hand side of the figure, you can see on the y-axis the number of tasks and packets that are unscheduled, mean, meaning they cannot really meet their deadlines. And as the number of generations goes on, as we evolve, as we go around the evolutionary algorithm, our goal is to move all the way to the point where we have zero unschedulable tasks and communication packets. In that point, I know that I found an optimization, an optimized uh, configuration that meets my timing constraints. And that's what we are looking for. Uh, the analytical model that we use for this kind of uh, system is an end-to-end -end response time analysis. What it does, it assumes some characteristics about the tasks that run on the processing cores and the packets that they will exchange and they use equations such as uh, the one that I'm going to show to calculate what is the worst response time for each task as they are running on each one of the processing cores. And this response time includes the time that the task needs to calculate something, to compute something, but also the time that it's blocked because some other tasks are using that CPU. You might have multiple tasks allocated to the same CPU. And in that case, other tasks will occasionally use the CPU preventing the task that we are analyzing from running. So in this case, we have equations that will tell us what is the longest time the task will take to finish its computation, including the time that it's blocked waiting for orders. And then when it starts communicating the results to memory interfaces, sensor interfaces, or to other tasks that need to work on those results, there will be also the same kind of response time, but over the communication network on chip. 
So we have some time where the packets are moving, sometimes when the packets are blocked, waiting for other packets to use the network, and so on and so forth. And we have done a lot of work in York to have models that can tell me for a given configuration of the system, for a given chromosome, so to say, for a given allocation of tasks to cores and allocation of packets to different network links, what is the worst case response time for the communication, for the computation, and then what is the worst case for the communication so that I can add both of them and check that if the task will meet their deadline even in the worst case. So the, the sum of the worst case response time for computation and the worst case response time for communication should be less than the deadline of that task. If that's the case, that task is deemed schedulable. And therefore, I will use those equations for each one of the chromosomes that I am trying to evolve and will count how many tasks I have in my configuration for each one of the genes, for each one of those allocations, I'll try to check how many of them fit, meet their deadlines according to those equations. And that's what we do in many of our experiments to optimize allocation of tasks to cores. We have here a fairly complicated plot that shows an experiment uh, of the evolution of uh, allocation of tasks to cores trying to optimize the real-time constraints. Let's go step by step on this figure. And first, I ask you to look uh, at the blue lines. And these blue lines, we have one of them that shows over the evolutional, evolutionary process, which is shown in the x-axis. So the x-axis increases with the number of generations. And we have two white y-axis. The one on the left-hand side, shows me the number of unschedulable tasks and packet flows for this particular system. We're, what we are trying to do here is to evolve the allocation of tasks of an autonomous vehicle benchmark that has about 38 tasks over a 16 core uh, network on chip multiprocessor. And the blue line with square uh, markers is actually telling me for each generation, how many of those tasks and, and packet flows are schedulable. And it starts with a random allocation that had about 13 schedulable, 13 uh, unschedulable uh, packets and, and flows. And as we see the process evolving, after 11 generations, we can see that it has already zero unschedulable tasks and flows. So all of the tasks and flows of the system are schedulable after 11 generations. And in the other blue line, we are measuring the dissipated power of that network on chip multiprocessor. And this is measured over the y axis on the right hand side. We can see that as the system evolves, the power of each one of the, the configurations, we are plotting the best configuration on each generation. We see that it improves and then it doesn't improve and then goes better and worse, better and worse, but there is no clear trend there. What we are doing there is we are trying to evolve, we are trying to put pressure only with a single fitness function, which is a fitness function that tries to get all the timing constraints to be met, all the real-time constraints to be met. And that's why in 11 generations, we manage already to find a configuration that meets all the timing constraints but it does nothing for energy. We cannot really say that the energy improves significantly because it doesn't seem to be a trend. It just seems to be changing randomly. Now, I ask you to look at the purple lines. These are a different evolutionary optimization of the same system. We're still trying to evolve a task allocation for that autonomous vehicle benchmark. Also 38 tasks over the same 16 core multiprocessor. And again, the square, markers are telling me the number of unschedulable tasks and packets and we can see here that it takes much longer for me to find a fully schedulable solution so the system had to evolve for 38 39 generations until i could get a fully schedulable solution but because i was using a second fitness function here so i was getting pressure not only from the timing constraints from the equations that i have shown in the previous slide i was also having a second fitness function that was telling me my, my evolutionary algorithm, how much dissipated power each one of those configurations would resolve. So it will try to 
improve both of them. And that's what it does. Every time you give more fitness functions for a, multiple, for a, for a genetic algorithm, it can try to cope with all of them, but the more uh, pressure you put, the harder it is for it to perform well across the different metrics. So in this case, you see that to, in, to inc improve the energy dissipation, to have a lower energy dissipation, it takes longer time to find a solution that meets the timing constraint. You can see this in, in real life, in evolution. Uh, if you, uh, you see it's much harder for uh, a horse to be bred for speed, but also to be bred for beauty. And it's something that you see in the, in the natural world as well. If you have more constraints, evolution will take longer to get there. And that's we have, what we have seen here. Now, can we make this even better? In this case, we have seen that after we reach the point where the, the solutions are fully schedulable, there is nothing that we can do. Once the lines with the, with the square markers touch the x-axis, we know, yeah, this configuration is good. But we know that we can have many configurations in the population. All of them have that same property. Can I tell which one is better over all of them that are fully schedulable? And to do that, we proposed a slightly different fitness function, which instead of counting the number of unschedulable tasks and flows as we did before, and as I'm recapping the upper right-hand side of the figure, now what I'm asking my fitness function to do is to calculate for each configuration how much faster or slower my system would have to be so that all the timing constraints of all tasks would be met. So what I'm saying here is for this configuration, before I was just using the equations to tell me, this configuration running at nominal frequency of the system, how many tasks are unschedulable? That's what I was doing before. Now what we propose here is with this configuration, scale up or down the frequency of my system make my system go faster or slower to make the system barely schedulable. So in this case, if I have in the beginning of my evolution, lots of unschedulable tasks and flows, which is normal, you can see here in the first plot with a red line on the upper right hand side, it means that I have many unschedulable tasks and flows to get the system to fully be fully schedulable with those configurations, I'll have to speed it up. So you can see in the green line in the lower right hand side that the speed up factor in the beginning of the evolution has to be very high because the quality of my configuration is not very good. So the fitness of each configuration is actually by how much I should speed up the system so that that system would become schedulable with that configuration. And as I evolve, the solutions we have that require a lower speed up can be seen as better. If it, this configuration requires me to run only with double the speed, this is better than the one that I need three times the speed. And then I keep evolving until I get a point where I cross the one line. We see there in the lower uh, right-hand side plot that at that point, it means that I can find a fully schedulable solution at the nominal frequency of the system. So that point when the green li line crosses the dashed line at a uh, breakdown speed factor of one, that's equivalent to the point that the red line, the unscalable tasks and flows, uh, flows line, touches the x-axis, meaning at that point, I found a solution that meets my timing constraints at the nominal frequency. The advantage of this approach is that I can carry on. I can still try to evolve to make, to find configurations that meet the timing constraints even at a slower frequency than the nominal frequency, meaning I'll get configurations that are better, but that were invisible to my, pro my previous fitness function. And that's something that we show in the big plot. We can see for different benchmarks, not only the autonomous vehicle that I've mentioned before, but uh, other synthetic benchmarks, we can see that we can find solutions that are even better than uh, what we can get at the nominal frequency. So this is an improvement of the fitness function I've mentioned before. At this point, I can say that we have done 
a significant amount of work into optimizing allocation of tasks into cores, improving energy, supporting multi-mode operation, assigning priorities to tasks, making sure tasks have security constraints met, making sure that the memory footprint of those tasks over multiple CPUs is minimized. So we have successfully uh, adapted this flow to a large number of optimization problems at the computation level. And they all required us to do some contributions towards the fitness functions. So how can I calculate what would be the worst case with that set of tasks at that allocation configuration with those uh, priority levels, with that memory uh, availability and so on. So we have contributed both in the creation of fitness functions and then using these fitness functions for su 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 successful evolution of optimization in many areas. And you have here links to many conferences and journals where have, we have published that work. And I'm happy to ask to, to answer questions about this later on. But at this time, I would like then to move into the next step, the next level. We talked about computational level. Let's talk about communication level now. And in this case, the optimization engine is again trying to improve the configuration of a system to try to meet timing constraints. And in this case, the configurations that we have in typical cyber physical system networks are routing tables, guaranteed uh, time slot allocations, uh, routes, uh, allocation, arbitration of network, buffer sizes. These kind of configurations are typical configurations that we need to uh, set up so that we can find guarantees for a given network in the sense that all the packet flows uh, will be able to meet their deadlines even in the worst case scenario. And the work I'm reporting here is a work that we have done within the MCCPS uh, project funded by the, the UK uh, Research Council for, for Engineering Physical Sciences with uh, colleagues of the Real-Time Systems Group. Uh, and the example that I'm, I'm going to highlight is uh, on wireless networks based on the IEEE 802.15.4 standard. And what we want here is to take a network infrastructure that uses this protocol. We want to take a load of communication packets that are sent from different nodes and have to be delivered to different nodes by their deadlines. And these packets will have different urgency levels, but these packets could also have also different criticality levels, meaning some packets are more important than others, even though sometimes they are not, they are not as urgent. They are really important and they have to be delivered by the deadlines, even though their deadlines might be longer. So urgency and criticality is differentiated in this work. And because this is a wireless network, we know that the wireless channel is imperfect. It's uh, vulnerable to a whole lot of uh, effects in terms of interference, in terms of noise. So we have a fault model which is uh, part of the approach and we specify which kind of faults we are expecting to see in the wireless channel and we actually allow uh, multiple configurations for this fault model and we allow the system to react to the uh, faults that it's experiencing in different ways. So we uh, proposed here in New York an extension to this IEEE standard. We call this airtight. And what it tries to do is under normal channel conditions, meaning for a given configuration of the fault model. So if the faults are within the bounds that I expect them to be, then my system should meet the deadlines for all levels of criticality of traffic. And if the channel conditions are worse than what I originally expected, if the channel conditions are not within the bounds that we assumed at design time, we still want the higher, higher criticality traffic to meet their deadlines, even in the worst case. And we want low criticality traffic then to be delivered in a best effort way, creating a sort of a graceful degradation. So this is what we want to have. We want to make sure that if everything is fine, we can find uh, a configuration for the system that all traffic will meet their deadline at all times. 
if the system is under a situation that is exceptional, if the channel conditions are exceptional and we cannot really meet the constraints for all traffic, we want only the critical traffic to be delivered by the deadline. So the system needs to adapt to provide this graceful degradation. And that's what we are using our evolutionary algorithms for. In this case, we are using the evolutionary algorithm to optimize the guaranteed uh, time slot tables that allocate transmission slots to each one of the network nodes. So in this case, you can already visualize the chromosome. In the previous example, the chromosome have tasks and processing cores where these tasks would go. In this case, we have nodes of the network and number of slots that they will be allocated. So we have uh, created chromosomes that will actually al allow the evolution of the number of slots that each network node will be given in such a way that we can guarantee that in the real, the, the, in the regular scenario, in the normal scenario, all packets meet their deadlines. And in the exceptional scenario, all the high crit packets will meet their deadlines. And we, I'm going to show you a case study of a 36 node network which is inspired on a on a airspace air, aircraft network with uh, 40 different message flows 25 percent of them um, are of high criticality and we did experiments in a single and a multi-channel configuration so single channel all nodes have to read and write over the same frequency and therefore only one uh only one node is transmitting at a time in multiple channels, we can have nodes transmitting over multiple channels at the same time, but uh, a node can only uh, receive or transmit in a single channel at a time. So the time slots have to be organized in such a way that a, 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 a particular node will not have a transmit slot in one channel and a receive slot in a different channel because it doesn't have two radios. It has only one radio and it has to listen or to transmit within that same channel. And our fault model is characterized by the minimal time between faults and the duration, the maximum duration of those faults. So what we want with the evolutionary optimization is to evolve a configuration for that slot table so that all nodes will have enough slots to perform their local scheduling decisions for the multiple packets they receive, which packets should be transmitted at each one of those slots so that we can guarantee timely delivery for all packets or in case of exceptional channel conditions only the high crit packets and let me show another complicated plot here and uh, in this case i'm showing again on the x-axis the evolution over multiple generations and the y-axis it's telling me the proportion of the packet flows that are meeting their timing constraints meeting their deadlines from zero to one and in this case here this scale uh, is slightly complicated because we have to make sure that the flow sets meet their deadlines in the regular case and this means from 0 to 0 0.5 means we found a configuration where 100 percent of the flows meet their deadlines and that means the scale from 0 to 0 0.5 and from 0 0.5 to 1 is we have found configurations that meet the timing constraints for everybody in the regular case, in the regular scenario, and also for the highly critical packets when the channel conditions are worse. So what we want is an evolution that goes from 0 all the way to 1. And then these plots show uh, dozens of different evolutionary processes with dozens of slightly slightly different uh, numbers of packets being transmitted from different nodes. And we showed that in many cases, our genetic optimization can find fully scalable solutions for the normal case. And that's how you see the lines converging towards that 0 0.5 uh, region. And then it, as the generations carry on, they just go and shoot up to the 100 percent meaning to the 1.0 meaning even in the extreme situations when the channel is extremely bad we can find configurations that will lead the 
highly critical packets to meet their deadlines as well. And we have this uh, experiment for the single channel, which is a single frequency where all the nodes uh, have to transmit. And you can see that this is much more difficult than the multi-channel, where we have the ability to get uh, nodes transmitting over different channels at the same time. So you see that there are only a few cases where the evolution took more than a few dozens of generations for the multi-channel time, uh, for the multi-channel case. And in this case, it's a three-channel uh, scenario. Now, uh, we have here the effect of having longer faults. And then I'll try to animate or go back and forth with shorter faults and with longer faults. As you can see, the longer the faults, my evolution takes longer. You see that the lines showing evolution will push towards longer evolution. And in some cases, you see that the lines will go all the way to 500 generations and they will not shoot up. They will not find a solution where they can find configurations that will meet the timing constraints of every packet, even in the worst case scenario. So this is something that will happen with evolutionary algorithms. Sometimes you cannot evolve a solution for your particular problem. You have to carry on. In this case, our condition here was to run for 500 generations. We saw that in many of the cases we could find, but in some cases we couldn't find a solution. That's what you have when you're dealing with uh, heuristic, meta heuristics. And at this point, I'll move to the third level, which is uh, optimization at the physical process level. And this is something that we have exploited within the EU funded project Sapphire, where we had uh, industrialists, people from the area of uh, uh, production, machines, uh, white good manufacturing. And what we wanted there was to improve the production processes. So the, the, the model of my system here would be a factory. And the configurations will be which operations will be assigned to which machines in those factories, which settings will be applied to each machines, which operation modes, whether the machines can be operating in an energy efficient mode or they have to be in high performance mode. So these are the configurations that we are looking for. And what we want is a configuration that will give the customers, the industrial uh, plants, uh, the ability to maximize the number of orders that they complete on time, maximize their profit, minimize their energy costs, this sort of optimization. And we are using exactly the same idea uh, for case studies that look completely different from the ones that we have seen before. So we have applied this to production optimization chemical plants, so mixing, dispersion, uh, we have done some work with uh, cement production, we have done some work with uh, paint production. Uh, another, in, this was done in partnership with uh, companies from, a company from Bremen called OAS, with, with the su support of a research center, uh, also from B Bremen, the ATB research center. We have uh, done some work with multi-objective optimization in industrial kitchens. So in this case, allocating different uh, tasks to different, uh, cookers to different hubs, to different fridges, and so on. And that was done uh, in cooperation with Electrolux, which was also partner in that Sapphire project. And the third uh, case study that we have applied was for cutting of metal parts using EDM process. So this is uh, done in partnership with ONA, a Spanish company from the Basque country. Uh, and they are uh, one of the top com com companies in the world doing this sort of precise uh, cuts using uh, electrical sparks. So they use electrical sparks to uh, etch away parts of the metal so that you can do a very precise cut. And the example that I've mentioned, that I will mention now is exactly from uh, one of the owner problems. And in this case, they have a number of time sensitive orders. So different customers will request different parts to be cut. And we are considering several parts here from uh, seven to 16 part types. And in a machine, in a factory with 12 machines of three different sizes and four operating modes each. So a wide variety of, of machines and operating modes. And what, I, what they asked us to do was to evolve a production plan so that they can have all those parts cut by the deadline and maximizing their profit. So taking into account different aspects. For instance, each one of those machines has different modes that have different costs per energy, per, per, 
cost of energy, also the electrical spark that those mach machines produce uh, requires specific wires and those wires wear out. So different wires have different quality, different price and will produce uh, the cut faster or slower. So this would, the configuration of those machines will have to involve what kind of wire, what kind of setting for energy saving. And you can imagine here the kind of chromosome that you have uh, in the evolution is shown uh, in the figure on top of the plot where we have a chromosome that is as long as the number of orders that will have to be uh, submitted. And for each order, uh, we have to, to set up which machine will work on that order, which mode of operation and which priority is that order with regards to the machine. So if you have multiple orders over that machine, in which order they will be produced. And what they wanted us to, to evaluate was, can we make allocations that will maximize their profit? And what was the difference between uh, allocations that will try to serve all orders regardless of uh, the quality of those orders versus discriminating which orders were more profitable and only doing those. And we managed to evolve configurations for those two setups that provided a significant improvement in their, uh, in their profit and having uh, a much earlier uh, delivery of the goods to their customers. So we, we managed to show that if they need to serve all customers, that's what they can do. But if they can, choose if they pick and choose they can get better profit by serving a selected set of customers and that's what we see in the plot with the blue and the red box plots for the make span and with the dashed lines for the profit blue uh, means the classic approach meaning serving everybody and red means only selected customers which are the ones that maximize your your profit and at this point, I will uh, move to the final part of the talk, which is on the execution of the evolutionary processes over cloud infrastructure. All those processes that I've mentioned, they are based on a lot of computation. The evolution of all those different chromosomes for all those different configurations, they take a lot of time and they take a lot of computation, uh, computation infrastructure. And it makes sense to run that over cloud uh, infrastructure because evolutionary algorithms are very amenable to parallel execution. And this is something that benefits from the idea of these elastic resources that we can get by cloud infrastructure. I can get more or less uh, resources dynamically and I only pay for what I use. And this is particularly useful for all those industrial partners that we were dealing with. So uh, the parallelism that evolutionary algor algorithms provide can be done at the fitness function level. So we have a population of a number of configurations. I can actually apply the fitness function to each one of those elements of my population in parallel if I can. I can also have multiple populations evolved in parallel. And this is the so-called island model so that you have multiple islands of individuals evolving separately. And by that, you can have each island running completely in parallel. And we exploit this uh, a lot in our research, and I'll show this in the next slide. And then there is a, another uh, level of parallelism is that you can mo run multiple evolutionary processes. If you're running a large optimization engine, you can be at the same time optimizing the machine cut, the, the, the metal cutting machine problem but at the same time optimizing the wireless network problem or the multiprocessor uh, system problem that I've mentioned before. So you can have multiple evolutionary processes. All of them have different deadlines, so you need to manage them differently, give more or less resources to each one of them. And that's something that we, still, we are still exploiting. What we have done so far are the first two, parallelism of the application of the fitness function and the more important one, uh, parallelism of multiple populations following an island model. And to do the island model, we are using a public cloud. So we are creating islands inside of Docker containers, and we are running them over Kubernetes clusters that are deployed on Amazon uh, um, 
public cloud effect effectively. So we just have infrastructure from Amazon so that we can deploy containers and they charge us for the amount of time these containers are running. And because we need to have some communication between the multiple uh, containers running multiple islands, we use a lightweight database, which is also inside of a particular container. And we deploy all that to Amazon to get this uh, evolutionary processes to run. And here is a big picture showing how this works. What we decide is the number of islands. I have to decide how many islands I want to evolve for each one of the processes that I'm managing, for each one of the evolutionary processes. And I uh, put each one of those islands in a Kubernetes pod. And then I give this to Amazon, and they have a load balancer that will take the pods and will decide how many pods will be executed inside of each one of the the instances that Amazon is selling to me. Each instance is a kind of a virtual machine. So the autoscaler will decide, depending on the computational load of my evolution, whether it can put more or less islands within a same instance. And as the evolutions are, as, as the systems evolve, the autoscaler from Amazon will actually deal with that load balancing for me. I don't even have to do much. I just need to decide, I want more islands, I want less islands, my evolution is taking longer, so let's get some more islands to parallelize the search and parallelize the, the evolution, and then Amazon will then give me more or less hardware accordingly. And I have, as I said, a pod for the communication over this Redis database. How do the islands work then? What are they doing? Each island has a number of configurations, and it will keep evolving until some termination condition is met, such as all my tasks have met their deadline, or I have minimized the make span of this production plan so that it fits in a 20 hour, 24 hour window and so on and so forth. So I can have uh, conditions for termination that are related to the fitness of a particular evolution. And then I have multiple islands and they're all uh, striving for that particular goal. They're all trying to find an individual trying to find a configuration that meets that constraint. And if I just leave them to run completely in parallel, eventually they might get there. But there are ways to try to improve their performance, improve the performance of the evolution by allowing migrants, meaning configurations to migrate from one island to another. So that once you get a good configuration from one island or a bunch of good configurations from one, one island, you can move them to another island where evolution is not going very well, where the fitness is kind of stuck, you're not getting better individuals over time, you can just seed some other individuals that will be mixed with the ones in that population and hopefully bring some better individuals. And overall, one of the islands at the end will reach the objective that you're looking for faster because of this cross migration over islands. So we have two operations, a push and a pull. A push is when an island has good individuals to migrate out and they go into the Redis database. And then when an island notices that its uh, fitness has stagnated over several generations, it can pull individuals that were pushed previously by other islands. And we have another interesting plot there, and I'll try to explain that plot. That plot is try to compare different migration strategies. The baseline is when I have no migration at all. And you can see there as none. You have a box plot with a quality rank that reaches up to four, perhaps some outliers a little bit more than four. And in this case, quality rank means the, the higher, the faster this particular configuration would find the objectives that I'm looking for, the optimization that I'm looking for. If I don't allow any migration, that's the quality that I can have. And then I have two different strategies to migrate out and then to migrate in, two different strategies for push uh, and four different strategies, sorry, the other way around, two different strategies to decide which, I'm which are the, the, the individuals of a population that I'm replacing and four different strategies to decide which are the individuals that I'm migrating out. So I can either replace random elements of my population or I can pick the worst elements and replace them. And those are those two parts of the plot, replace random and replace worst. 
So when I'm bringing somebody in from other islands, who do I drop, randomly or worse? And uh, we can see that the box plots in the worst are a little bit higher, meaning that it makes sense to re replace the worst uh, individuals of a population. And that's quite intuitive. But now when we compare the different migration uh, strategies to get who am I migrating out, who, which are the individuals that I'm getting out of my islands so that they can be used in other islands, we Im immediately thought that it would be always good to take only the top individuals, get the best individuals and send them out. And we realized that that doesn't work. We had to either pick randomly or, in the best case, get the most diverse set we could for migrating out, which is really interesting, especially when you have multiple objectives, when you want to maximize multiple objectives or minimize multiple objectives. Having diverse individuals to diversify the populations was always, or in most cases, better than only getting the best. And this is an interesting uh, outcome that we found. At this stage, I can close uh, my talk and uh, say that we have done a lot of work in evolutionary optimization. It's powerful, but it requires also some research on the application of the fitness function. How can you make fitness functions that are fast, that are accurate enough, that can be parallelized in a way that you can scale up and that uh, meet your, your optimization objectives? Uh, we try to have this consistent research vision and we apply the same vision over multiple levels of cyber physical systems. And as an academic, many of you, academics, many of you have the same problem. We try to, to have the research vision supported by some funded projects instead of just going after the different uh, calls and different projects that we could have. And that's getting harder and harder these days to believe in a particular research and try to get funding to bring that research forward rather than the, than the other way around. And still we could have something that was uh, uh, applied to industrial problems with industrial relevance. Um, the opti optimization using evolutionary algorithms fits really well the idea of cloud infrastructure using containers because we can have multiple types of parallelism that we can exploit. And we then can trade off between the time to get a good solution, the cost we have to pay to Amazon to get a good solution, and the quality of the solution that I can achieve. If you pay more, if you take longer time, you're likely to get uh, a better quality, but you can all, cannot always improve those three things at the same time. And I will just have one minute about two of each one of the two research topics that I'm working at the moment. One of them is to use the whole idea of evolution to actually evolve my fitness functions. At the moment, I mentioned to you that we have some equations that we use for fitness functions, and we did a lot of research on those equations. I didn't really talk about that research. We have plenty of papers if you want to learn more. But those equations were done by humans. We were there sitting down, trying to understand the systems and trying to figure out equations. And uh, what we are trying to do now is to try to evolve fitness functions as well. So to try to get automatic creation of those equations, which sounds kind of science fiction, but uh, we are trying to look into that. And the second future research is instead of having all this optimization happening at the cloud using Docker containers on Kubernetes and Amazon, we want to have some of those parts of the optimization happening closer to the actual edge of the cyber physical system, closer to the sensor, closer to the actuators, closer to the machines. So instead of sending everything to a cloud and doing the optimization on the cloud and then getting the results back, we want to partition that so that some optimization tasks that are simpler can be done by smaller machines that are close to the, to the edge of the network, close to the end users, close to the machines, close to the systems, the sources and destinations of the data. And that's something that we are uh, trying to get some funding for. And at this stage, I would like to thank you for your attention and I will welcome questions. Well, thank you very much, Leandro. So we are uh, waiting for questions. So you can do questions in Portuguese, English, Spanish, or French. So, um, I, I... yes. So, uh, 
waiting for questions uh, i can do one uh, so uh, your work uh, is uh, mainly based in, in the use of uh, clouds no so what do you think about uh, the sharing of uh, processing between uh, cloud and local uh, facilities like using a bench of uh, hardware like fpgas to run the algorithms and so on how you you can uh, do the best uh, sharing between using clouds or local uh, running well this is this is one of the research questions that i've mentioned here and it's a it's an interesting interesting point that nowadays you can even get cloud nodes that have an fpga that you can delegate some computation and get this to be done on fpga on a cloud node somewhere in amazon google has that same facility as well and this is uh this is working well the problem is sometimes the latency from a cyber physical system that is connected to the cloud from the particular cyber physical system node to go all the way to the cloud send data request for optimization and get an optimized configuration back that latency is too long so it will be in many cases necessary to have a suboptimal optimization happening locally while another improvement could be happening in the background so that you can have a two stage or three stage or several stage optimization where you get slightly better uh, solutions as you get time to go all the way to the cloud and back but some of the optimization should be done near the end system so the latencies will be much shorter so that's something that we're trying to explore Leandro maybe you can put your camera on uh, so yes uh, one point is that uh, for some critical system uh, you cannot um, uh, cope with uh, delays of connections no so uh, to be for some critical system important to have a local process you know that's that's the case and uh in a lot of the, the the research that we are doing if we are dealing with safety critical systems we have configurations that will not change and the configurations for the hard real time tasks they will be defined and usually verified in advance and then the optimization that you can do is mainly for best service energy optimization while maintaining the, the hard real-time constraints. In the case for uh, the industrial systems that I've mentioned at the end, the factory systems, those deadlines are not really hard real-time. So that's why we could do a lot of optimization remotely on the cloud in a way that is very uh, uh, speculative rather than something that can give guarantees. Uh, there is a question by Professor Altamiro Suzin. So we working, we are working on Vision chips. It is a knock based SOC with an initial configuration of 16 RISC V processors being tested on FPGA. The application is AV, robotic driver assistance, and so on. So we are dealing only with the video system from image capture to structure from motion and visual odometry so the question is how to partition the application to distribute over the processors finer grain tasks or more pipeline oriented structure the measure would be delay communication cost and so on okay so i can say how we uh, did that we have a, a one of the benchmarks that i've mentioned it's similar to that and what we created were uh, task chains so you have tasks uh, processing and communicating to the next task in the chain that communicates to the next task in the chain and so on. And what we did was to establish a sort of a synchronous pipeline so that these tasks will get video frames from, from some memory. And then as it goes through the pipeline, all the stages of the pipeline should be meeting timing constraints in the worst case. So we have response time analysis for each stages of the, each of the stages of the pipeline and then we can compose those to the end-to-end -end deadline which should support the frame rate of the, the the video camera so if you're doing stereo photogrammetry you have at least two high resolution cam cameras there plus a lot of processing they are all pipelined and you need to have end-to-end -end deadlines that meet uh, the frame rate and 
you have uh, once you have those pipelines, you have hundreds of million different ways to map those pipelines over your 16 cores. And that's where we feed that to the GA. And the GA will try those different configurations using the response time analysis that we have proposed to find an allocation of those synchronous pipelines such that some steps, some stages of those pipelines, and some of them will be mapped to the same core. Some of them will not. But it will guarantee that over the network on chip, you will have uh, enough bandwidth so that the tasks will execute in the course, communicate over the links of the network on chip, and will meet the timing constraints. So the genetic algorithm is actually used to find that allocation of those synchronous pipelines. This is we have uh, a case study of this in our Journal of Systems Architecture paper from 2014, and I'm happy to talk to Suzim in more detail about that. Thank you. So we have a question by Carlos Lanius. So can updating the cost function be guided by machine learning strategies if there is enough data that can be selected in real time? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, in one of our latest papers for the industrial optimization problems, we have used a spe specific kind of GA that uses uh, learning techniques to identify uh, links between the different uh, chromosomes. So sometimes your chromosomes affect the fitness function completely differently, but sometimes your, the genes in your chromosome will uh, affect the fitness function in the same direction. So the learning process actually tries to uh, identify which, chromos which parts of the chromosome contribute in the same way to the fitness function so that it guides the mutation and crossover uh, operations so that these genes will be modified together or will always be modified separately according to their to their correlation in terms of affecting the fitness function i, I went very deep into ga's here but uh, i think carlos understands that we have uh, done some work in the past so there is there are classes of ga that use learning techniques to understand the different parts of the chromosome, how do they interact with each other to affect the fitness? And as you learn that, you can make more efficient crossover and more efficient mutation. And that accelerated uh, significantly the, the evolution. And that's something that we have submitted to the top journal in uh, evolutionary algorithms, and we're still under review at the moment. So another question, I think uh, there is no more so thank you very much leandro it was a great pleasure to have your talk today my pleasure thank you very much for the invitation